live stream set up on YouTube. I'll just give it a minute to get going. Okay, we get that going. Just trying to see volume over there, so there's no echo. Okay. Um, people can uh, certainly leave messages. I'll be happy to answer questions or discuss topics if you're interested. You can always do that in the chat. And uh, there's also live feed in, on my YouTube channel. So I'll check messages there once in a while, as usual. And uh, I'd like to start today with uh, a little excerpt from my, is this reverse for you guys or is it all backwards? I don't know. But uh, this is my wife's book that I plays it. She named it after me, Good Young to Fuck. She has a uh, 750 page. Uh, women to women uh, collection of all the holidays and traditions that women send to one another. It's the only one of its kind. Um, but she broke, no one's going to read a 750 page book, so it's based on each holiday. This is Hanukkah. And the intro is from the granddaughter of the, um, of the one of the Chernobyl lines, which is called Hornish Stifle. And her name is Malky Friedman, her husband is the Rebbe. He's the one who's taught me the majority of anything I know. And uh, she wrote a little forward here. And it's apropos for Tisha B'Av. And I'll read as far as Rebbe Yisrael Spira. I'm going to keep him, let people on the chat here. Uh, Rebbe Yisrael Spira, the Grand Rabbi of the Muzar told of his experience during the Second World War. The day preceding the first night of Hanukkah was for the inmates of Bergen Belsen a nightmare within a nightmare. A contingency of SS officers made a selection amongst the Jewish inmates. The men chosen in this selection were gathered outside the barracks and savagely beaten and bludgeoned to death. Their bodies were left in a heap. Nightfall for the first night of Hanukkah. The Jewish inmates of Bergen Belsen took a wooden clog that till then had been shooed and designated it the Hanukkah menorah. Some smuggled shoe polish replaced the traditional olive oil, and the shoe string became a lick. Please, Rebbe, the group pleaded to the village of the Rebbe, light the Hanukkah milk for you. The Rebbe stood with a trembling hand and began to recite the blessing of lights for Uchatab. Who has commanded us to light the lights of Hanukkah? Who has made miracles to our fathers in those days at this time? When the Rebbe began to recite the third, third blessing, he paused and turned to look behind him. He then turned back to the Menorah and shouted the Shachlan and blessing in a strong voice. After the light and the Rebbe was approached a secular man with whom the Rebbe had many discussions on faith and religion. This man asked how the Rebbe, how could he make a blessing, who has kept us alive, preserved us, and enabled us to reach his time. Rabbi, the bodies from the last action are outside our very door. We live from misery to horror. How can we possibly, in all good conscience, make that blessing time? The Rebbe nodded and answered, my friend, exact same question came to my mind as I was saying the first two blessings. Before I began reciting the third lesson, I turned around to ask the distinguished rabbis behind me what to do. But when I turned, I saw behind me the throng of Jewish prisoners, their faces shining with faith and devotion as they concentrated on the lighting of the Hanukkah lights. I said to myself, Hashem has the most unique of all Hashem has the most unique of all nations. At the darkest times in our history is a people where death is lurking in every corner. And despite that reality, they stand with integrity. They stand with integrity, participating in the midst of the lights. If I was blessed to see such a people with so much faith and fervor, I am under a special obligation to recite the third blessing, Shehech 
The lights of Hanukkah enable us to pierce the darkness of the world and empower us to persevere through the challenges of our lives. I guess because it's my wife, I'll finish the last paragraph. I applaud Rabbit Sinclair for the beauty and depth of this unique book. I would like to take this opportunity to be a call out for Jewish women of Israel. We all must be strong. The future of the Jewish nation rests on your shoulders. May we revel in the lights of Hanukkah and pass on to our children and loved ones joy and devotion to our Creator. Rebbe Simonki, for you. Uh, about once a year, I say about once a year because I don't always have the courage to open this book. This is a book that is uh, not for the faint of heart. It's called the Hasidic uh, Tales of the Holocaust. And uh, is it backwards on there uh, or is it frontwards? Not if it's backwards. Is it backwards for you? Or shake your head if it's not backwards. It's fine. We read it's it. just backwards. Um, my it's camera is backwards. Anyway, this is called the Hasidic Tales of the Holocaust. And um, I can only open this one day a year. And I can't even open it every year. Every year. But, uh, it was a prayer and a dream that kept me alive in Bergen Bells. It's interesting. I hope I open pretty randomly. This is called a prayer and a dream. And uh, interestingly, this is back in Bergen Bells. I was actually at Bergen Bells and I never had any interest in going to a, uh, into a, a camp. I hadn't even been in a Bergen Bells in the camp. Um, and maybe it wasn't called Bergen Bells. I don't think it was called Bergen Bells. What's, what's the name of the, Shai, you know the name of the place outside Munich? Is that Bergen Bells? No, that yes, that was Bergen Bells. Oh, that was Bergen Bells? I believe so. The best we could do was stand on the on the chairs of an SUV to see into it. And the cops came and said uh, we had to get, get out of there because they were like, you know, Nazis uh, coming around and vandalizing and making violence there. It was a prayer and a dream that kept me alive in Bergen Bells and said Sheila Guns. It was a very special prayer and a dream, a dream in which reality overshadows dreams and dreams overpower reality. Rabbi Gross, a Hasidic Jew from Slovakia, taught us the prayer in King. I don't know if the prayer is written down in any prayer book or if it existed out before the concentration camp era, a time when the, the living were the walking dead and the dead the only link with a normal world that was gone forever. It was a prayer that seemed created from the crematoria ashes, a prayer from the valley of death that kept the soul alive. We prayed it every minute of our wretched existence. It gave us so much hope, so much strength, so much light. But one day after the war, the words of the prayer just left me one by one until today. I can't remember them. I hope that somewhere rather gross is alive and remembers this prayer. When liberation was nearing the gates of Bergen Bells, I became ill with typhoid, delirious, and near death. I kept repeating the prayer of the gross talk, but its words were moving further away from me till I heard only the faint echo, like the fluttering of wings in the distance. Suddenly, in the vacuum left by the prayer, I distinctly heard my mother's voice. We are all God's children. We are all God's children. He can do with us whatever he chooses. She repeated the phrase over and over again. I was walking towards my mother's voice. We were all marching a woman work detachment, head shaven, dressed in gray with wooden shoes on her swollen feet. Six abreast, we walked through the camps and made 
We marched towards my mother's voice. We walked through the snow-covered fields and frozen rivers, through peaceful villages where, where blue smoke from house chimneys was gently making its way to the sky. We begged for bread, but no one heard us. The villagers looked through us as if we were transparent as thin air and went up on up with their business as if we didn't exist. We reached my hometown. There it was springtime and the lilac bushes were in full bloom. Lilac bushes were in full bloom. It was Friday night. Shabbos candles were glowing in each window. Fathers and sons dressed in their Shabbos attire were rushing into the shtiblach, the small Hasidic prayer houses in the city synagogue. They too did not notice us. I knew them all and called them by names, but my words were were voiceless, just soundless movements of my mouth. I could hear the clatter of our wooden clogs on the cobblestones. I could hear the sound of their leather shoes as they rushed to play, but pray that no one heard us nor saw us. It seems that in the book here that she's in the dream. My mother's voice was very near. Around the corner of the doorway, she was standing away in the outstretched arms. She was dressed in her Shabbos finery with a snow white apron. I fell into her waiting arms. Mother, I cried, I can't go on anymore. The mother hugged me, caressed me, and her gentle touch made my hair grow. And in her soft voice, she told me, my child, don't worry, everything will be all right. You will cover and soon be liberated here, my child. There is food which I prepared for you. She gave me the filter, there's chicken soup and freshly baked flour. When I opened my eyes, I saw my friends on the wooden planks around me staring at the amusement. They couldn't believe I was alive. I hadn't succumbed to the typhoid. I felt strong and sat up. I could feel the warm, gentle, kind hands of my mother supporting me. The taste of the fish and the aroma of the freshly baked flowers filled the stench ridden with urban bells and barracks. A few days later, we were liberated. There's some people that are the real weight, the gravity of our situation in this exile is uh, it's getting lesser each year because because we are um, you know distracted beyond belief with uh, the day to days. The day, the big day, you know, um, stuff, you know, or day in and day out of life. And, um, obviously, the technology of really, that's all around um, distracted, you know, and, and also, you know, we live in uh, an opulence that we, we don't realize. We're living, but the, uh, the immediacy of, of food and water and shelter is also constantly here, and, and um, it's hard for us to to sense the sense the depth of the exile. Uh, for some of us, though, however, the, it's more intense now than ever. Um, I'm not comforted much by, by the, the technologies or the freedoms that I've experienced. And I'm, I'm grateful for them, I'm just not comforted by them. I am very grateful. I am really grateful. Um, you know, I certainly appreciate the immediacy of all of the creature comforts and I would love my bed. Right here from all over the world, and um, certainly a lot of the, the music that had last through my speakers and, and the incredible uh, times that the good times. I don't know, maybe because of what I do for a living, helping people, 
I get to my share of the suffering, being with people I'm going to suffer. Anyway, um, but I know how not not ideal it is. You know how not ideal it is. Um, why I, I imagine it's because the uh, it's because the I don't know I, I I think it was the vacuous the vacuous world of my upbringing you know in the, I, I just sensed it empty you know I sensed it empty I didn't. And I didn't. I didn't see the salvation in, in uh, this in modern approach to uh, life. Uh, I mean, it, it just didn't redeem me at all. There was no level of redemption that it offered. There was no con con consolation in it. And the weirdest thing was I, I, I didn't even know there was a God. I didn't know there was so. I didn't know Tony was anything real. I thought he said, man, the book and uh, God. But yet I was really inconsolable in my just my desire for me. And anyway, the, the later finding out about a sharing and later finding out about Terry. Um, I wasn't really consoled. I was consoled only existentially uh, that life's not meaningless. And that was a huge consolation. But it was an existential consolation. That life's not meaningless was, was a huge salvation for me. Huge. And obviously made me into one of the happier people. One of the happier people. People know. Because you know, meaning and happiness go together. I'll share that teaching since I'm, since I'm the one speaking. I'll share that teaching. The teaching is I get it from Jordan Peterson. I don't know if you put it this um, in such a pithy way. And it was never make happiness the goal. The goal is meaning. If you live a meaningful life, you will be happy. Now, without a God, meaning isn't really. And, and sadly, um, for, well, maybe for Gentiles that works, but for Jews, our um, search engine is too strong for being that um, fooled by our own imaginations of what is meaningful. It, it falls short. I mean, it works a little, but you just wind up with uh, you know that Victor Frankl man's search for meaning, uh, depression. And we can't get out of it, really. The only way out is really with a God, God uh, discovery. But unfortunately, unlike Gentiles as well, that a God discovery is like, doesn't mean some blind faith and some, you know, just doesn't work for the Jewish mind. You know, we're not going to do a blind faith. And, uh, it's some kind of crib. What is this on my shoulder? It's a chair. I didn't even look at my studio. Seeing there's like some kind of board from a concert in the background of the concert. Anyway, so, but discovering, discovering this, discovering that, that there's truth in this, and truth, that the Torah is true, is um, a huge existential consolation, but and it brings meaning, it brings happiness, but zero consolation for the state of affair, affairs. Because the world, you know, as we know, it seems to be going to hell in a bad hand um, We're living in the times where we could be best, you know, really be best at, a, uh, at fixing things, yet we are um, kind of causing our own self the immigration um, with all of our technology, all of our ability, we, we don't seem to be able to help ourselves much. And quite the opposite, we seem to be 
um, you know, it seems that the world is in a cultural war and they're at each other's throats. And, and uh, though it, uh, most of it occurs online, you know, it's just one step away from occurring in person. And, and, um, you know, does God mean it can be saved before too much damages them? And I am consoled by the Hasidic revolution that's going on. Um, it seems everyone under 40 is uh, in the Hasidic community is just completely uh, sensing that, that the, the, I guess the best terms is a mat, they're, they're mad as hell and they're not going to take it anymore, something like that. And, um, I guess it's just a matter of time until they develop down a enough system so that they can, um, you know, make sure the kids, kids don't get the right to what they went through. Um, but it's so interesting. See, I trust, I always trust the masses of the young Hasid in the history. And, uh, the reason being is that they are the last vestige of instinctual tribal. Judaism. I mean, I'm sure the Yemenites have that kind of thing, but they're, you know, kind of a far flung people. Um, but the Hasidic Jews are the last of the non intellectual Jews. Um, they are instinctual Jews. And they are all that are, you know, it's just amazing to watch. And, and it's, and, and they have, and then, and interestingly, these young Hasidic Jews have no interest in throwing away Torah or Judaism. It's amazing. It's amazing. They're actually quite, uh, quite excited about their Judaism, though not very interested in hearing from anybody or asking any questions or anything. But amongst these young people are some great Torah scholars. And they get it. They get it. They're a new generation. They just need a little brain in their beard. They're just so young. And of course, the, the people at the helm will have to know how to do the right thing and uh, usurp, uh, allow them to, to usurp their leadership, and, which is the way life's supposed to be. You know, life is always a dichotomy of conserving the past in a very uh, non creative way, and while at the same time creatively moving towards the future that speaks to. Speaks to people whose feet are on the ground of reality. And so, please God, that's going to happen. And when it does, maybe even the non Hasidic groups, the yeshiva and Sephardic groups, might accept that kind of uh, trend. We'll see what happens there. If they care to, you know, they're, they're just like, you know, when you don't have instincts, you also you to lose your sense of. Of uh, well being. And if you don't have a sense of well being, well, then a loss of well being also is not a sense. And that's how you can watch people, you know, going day after day after day, you watch them walking down the street. It's like this guy is the epitome of lost well being and the epitome of not noticing a loss of well being. You will see people like that. What you don't know. I guess don't, doesn't hurt, but it can hurt you in the long run. So um, I'm, I'm willing to be uh, prompted by anybody. The thing, the issue always comes up every just about three twice. I, it's hard for me to switch gears. Oh, is it a little quiet? I'm sorry. Let me see if I can turn it on. My volume. I don't think I can. Let me see if I can. Programmable. No, I don't think so. Um, what I can do is maybe. 
Uh, you're just going to have to turn your volumes up, I think. Can you hear me okay? Am I speaking too quiet? What's happening is I don't have my mo normal mic. Um, maybe if I move my regular mic, because it's not on at all. Maybe that'll, uh, that might help. Because then I, I, will, I, will, I think maybe psychologically I'm pretending that I'm getting mic'd from here when really I'm getting mic'd from like a mic on a, on a laptop in the corner of the room. Anyway, it's hard for me to transition because the, uh, what I mean by transition is, is I'm, I'm used to, I only bring joy to people, even if it means we have to go to some dark place, but I only bring joy. And on Tisha B'Av, the only day I'm willing to like go into the, in the mud. I don't like going in the mud. I'm not feeling naturally, like I never naturally want to go there. So if you're interesting, interested in me, um, feel free to... Uh, Um, yeah, if you're interested in me um, saying something that's, uh, you know, you want to draw me, draw me towards a subject, I really will speak um, as much, as much about whatever you want me to speak about. I mean, I'm, I'm totally game to speak about whatever it is you want me to go speak about. Here, I'm going to bring the mic closer now. I did do so without unplugging the whole thing. Books. Um, maybe I'll read some of these stories too, if you want. Okay, it should be getting louder now. I think that's the closest I can get it. Did that get better on the volume? I just brought the laptop much closer to me. Um, yeah. All right. And um, I don't think I can turn up the mic here. Let's see. There was, no, it doesn't offer any volume on the mic on this thing. Shame. All right. So cool. Um, so since you're with me, I'll go back into this crazy book, which is you know, super freaked out. Um, so someone, wants to someone did ask a question um two people how we can dig deeply into our own gullas um you'll have to explain what that means bracha, to dig deeply into our own gullas and uh and then the other one was the division that caused so much hurt is something that i just can't understand so also on that question i'm happy to speak about that but uh Division between what and what? I don't know which division you're discussing. And Bruchi said, what's the balance between feeling Hashem's pain and pain of Golas and living in blessing and permanence? Yeah. So I'll handle that. That's a clear question. While the other two can please uh, uh, explain their questions. Um, so the things like this... Hashem has goals for creation, and we're far from them. We need to feel that deeply. You know, that, that has to be felt deeply. Um, at the same time, the same God who makes that gullus has lined your body with cells that, like, touch. You know, you have a bunch of nerve endings in the fingertips way more than anything else. Like, the side of your hand can't feel coins the way your fingertips could feel a coin in your pocket or in your purse. The, uh, the nerve endings in your eyes and in your ears sound, the touch, the, the taste. It's like he clearly wants your pleasure and he clearly wants you to live in abundance because there is that abundance. So he wants you going for, you know, for sure to be Makadish, to, to sanctify him in everything you touch, everything you do. We're here to do that. Like a Jew isn't just a Jew. A Jew is, a, is an altar. They're a Mizbeach. Not pick and it up. W w the, a Jew is a Mizbeach. And we are here to raise everything up and raise it up, raise it up, raise it up. And the more, the, the better the quality of your fruit, the better the fruit shake, the better the taste buds taste it, the better you're inspired by the, by the nutrients that it gives you. And you go out with all that abundance and, and make this world. And, uh, 
more beautiful place. And so, so, but at the same time, we have to be aware of, of the fact that, that we are so far from, from anything that, that is ideal. I mean, we are, we're just <laughs> miles away from, from the, the point and purpose of it all, what we're doing here in this world. And, and what, just to let you know, I mean, just, I mean, you all know, but just to remind everybody what I mean by the purpose of this world is that the whole, the whole purpose of this world is just to make us. The only thing we're doing here is to cleave to God, but not as it just as individuals. It's for the planet, the planet to cleave, cleave to God. It could have happened through us, just through, a, first of all, it could have happened through Adam. I'll repeat the, I mean, you guys, maybe if you're here, a lot of my class, you've heard the four stages of history, but the first was just humanity, to cleave to God, to be totally at one with God, humanity. Then it went to the Jews in, uh, uh, through, um, oh, by the way, that was a 20 generation disappointment. Then Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Jewish people in Egypt, coming out of Egypt, getting the Torah to become a pilot nation, step two was going to be the Jews as a pilot nation like this orb of light in Jerusalem that would send vibrational oneness with God throughout the planet. And that was stage two of history. Um, that, um, after close to 500 years, that failed. We went into a 70-year exile. We created the second temple for another less than 500 years. Also failed. Um, that was a total failure, um, being an orb of light. We just didn't pull that off. I don't want to go deeper into that right now, but but the one point I do want to mention about that is that is that um, that there's no chance in hell if the temple was rebuilt today that it would last more than 24 hours. So so the meaning meaning what needs to be done is is a an absolute overhaul of us, we need to be overhauled as human beings. It has to be a full overhaul because, because we already learned from the first two temples that it's the, the people, requ are requ we, the people, human beings are required to be the, the other end of the relationship. And so having this middle Jerusalem thing between God and us is, is not a, uh, you know, it's, it's not like we can be out of the equation. So a temple's meaningless without us being whole. We have to be whole. And if you think the temple's going to make us whole, well, it didn't make anyone whole in the first temple, and it didn't make anyone whole in the second temple. Period. Now, of course, a Mashiach could be a major game changer and change the hearts of everybody like that immediately. Could be. And please God, it will be, because we're certainly not going to do it on our own. You know, it doesn't exempt us from trying. <laughs> It's not up to you to finish the war, the work. It's not a, a, up to you to finish the work, but you're never exempt from trying. You can't stop trying to fix the world. We all have to do our best to fix the world. And anyway, but we blew that. So step one was humanity. Step two was humanity, but via the Jews. Then what God did, he's not going to change that plan again because we had the Torah, it says many times in the Torah that he's never going to trade that in. That's the Torah is not going to be traded in. Uh, no offense, people who believe their religions come out as God, like as if the second temple somehow we were forsaken and now there's new chosen people. The Torah says, and God doesn't lie if he says that we're an eternal nation, you know, that he chose us as an eternal nation. So that's that sticks, you know. You can't can't really get rid of that. Um, so then, the so then with the destruction, the second temple is what we call the um, I call it the the carpet bomb uh, version of De Vegas, which is that okay, maybe the world won't be in De Vegas, but there will be a what's called ethical monotheism that the Jews will be sent into exile throughout the world and teach the world about God, mostly through, not through education, but through uh, uh, example, that there will be Jewish communities all over the world. And those Jews all over the world will be God people 
and um, and then that would be step three. Stage three would be that uh, that the Jewish people would just live by example in exile, and then the final is now. That's the period we're in, which is the redemptive process of uh, the Jews coming back to um, Israel. Um, this started uh, 250 years ago with great Kabbalists who all simultaneously, in the spontaneous, you know, realization, they sent their students to Israel, the Baal Shem Tov, the Ben Shai, the Sephardim, the Vilna Gon. These are remote regions of the world. The Yemenites, like they discovered, like these great Kabbalists discovered that the redemption is near and they sent their students to Jerusalem, to Israel, to Jerusalem. And, um, and that began this amazing process that we're now in, which is, a, which is its own process. And it has to do with uh, great pain and high stakes with the, with the um, you know, obviously the whole Palestinian, it's interesting I'm saying this while rockets are flying, um, with the whole Palestinian Israeli issues going on. And, and uh, that whole, you know, you know, just this group, you know, this we're in a we're in a crazy situation. You know what? You know, nations protect their borders from enemies. Israel, Israel has the the bordered en border enemies, and many quite further than the border, all over the world. But it also has its own internal ground. The enemy has its own internal ground force already in the country. And by the way, none of this has to do with the. The sweet sweetheart Palestinian Israeli, you know, the ones who were like, you know, like so embarrassed. Like, like for example, every time they, they start lobbing ro rockets over Israel and and making trouble in the streets of Israel, the um, you know, the, I don't know if you guys know Israel, but the, there's these like really sweet Arabs that we get to hang out with and meet in the malls and and see them at. Uh, we get to see them at uh, when we're in the wilderness. You know, they love nature too. We're often in the wilderness with them. They're sweet people. They're like amazing people, and they're and they're so ashamed. I mean, because they so want to be accepted by the Israeli population, but but then all of a sudden, when things are tough here, and they get like strip searched every time they try to cross over or go into a mall or anything, because Israel's allowed to profile, so they get heavily profiled. And it's such a it's, it's terrible, but what can we do? You know, they, they seem to have no impact on the, on their counterparts who want to destroy the Jews of Israel. But um, anyway, they're constantly being humiliated. And part of that humiliation also causes more of them to go to the other side against Israel. Um, anyway, but that's step four. Step four is this, redemp this highly redemptive process that we're in. Um, and that's that's where we're at, and it's very confusing. It's not easy to understand. We have to keep our heads clear, and we have to have leadership, uh, meaning individual leadership. Like we have to have who we go to for clarity, um, and rabbis. We also have to have our heads in Torah knowledge and with the wisdom of Torah, and we and we have to do our best to help everyone else that we know, so that we can continue uh, giving strength to one another um, to get through this time. It's crazy times indeed. And, and I do believe for those watching this in exile that, that we do have to also have our plans to be in Israel. Um, we have to be real with the fact that there, you know, I know everyone believes the future is never coming, but every single observant Jew you will ever meet, if you ask them if there's an overall future for the Jews outside of the land of Israel, Every single one of them, at least if they're wearing one of these, or you know, or they're keeping Shabbat, no one would say there's a future outside of Israel. The thing is that they're kind of hoping the future is like they're hoping it's like redemptions, like fifty years from now or a hundred years from now, like some other time. I have, they probably want it in their lifetime, so maybe they want it thirty years from now, um, but they don't want it to be now. And. Um, but in my opinion, like if you have kids, so your children are the representation of the future. I mean, if you have kids, they are the future. Okay, if it's not going to be them, then it will be their grandchildren, but your grandchildren. But there's a future, you know, that you're you're meeting every day that you're in touch with your chick, your offspring, whether it's your children, your grandchildren, and 
and that since we were clearly in some kind of process back to Israel, and that the prophets also clearly state, you know, like when we read the Gog and Mogog of uh, the whole Gog and Mogog uh, stories of you know, we, the Haftorahs that we read in Sukkot, when it talks about the advent of Mashiach, that it's clearly, you know, the Jews are in Israel. And then it's not, not about Brooklyn. It's, it's the Jews in Israel, like the real Jewish population living in Israel. So, so it's pretty clear to me that we've got to be doing that. And, and also to note that we're, because Israel's a parliament, you know, we wouldn't be, Israel wouldn't look like such a bad option to the observant Jews of the exiles if the observant Jews of the exiles lived here because, because who, the legislation of Israel is based upon population. And if, you're, if you had it, a couple million strong observant population, i.e. English Jews, European Jews, East Coast Jews, uh, the observant Jews of Los Angeles, Chicago, uh, Atlanta, you know, Philadelphia. If those Jews would just get on a plane and get over here, we would not have the the, the ruling, the rulership over Israel would be of a Torah leadership. leadership. Anyway, the bottom line is we've got to be super real, super sober about our situation. And on the other hand, we've got to be a kid. We've got to be Makadi Shimshamayim with the Shefa, the, the abundance that's at our fingertips. A little of both, a little of both. Like, and we're going to do it all. You know, If you're going to play guitar, play a good guitar. If you're going to have, sing for people, have a pack the place and serve them some good meat and, and good wine. You know, like let's, let's, uh, we got to have the both worlds. We got to have the depth of the exile and the de- uh, meaning and really be present to it. Don't be consoled by it. Don't get distracted by it. Stay raw, stay real with our real, with the real predicament of Hashem's world. And, but at the same time, you know, if you're going to go on a jacuzzi, you know, it should be a big one full of people you love hanging out with, you know. The, uh, if you're going to go biking, you know, get a nice bike. You know, if you're going to go down the steep mountains, so you can fly to the Swiss Alps and, and enjoy it. You know, so so you got to you got to live the balance of the of the two. Um, so the next question, the next question is, um, um, I think I answered the question from Shai of what we can do to bring Gaula faster, but. Um, I think the most important thing is that we are um, that we are treating ourselves as the problem. We're the problem. Stop thinking the problems outside of you. You know, we're the problem. We're we we are the the um, the horbin. The horbin is the word for the destruction of the temple. The horbin. We're the horbin. So if you treat yourself as the horbin, and and once you treat yourself as the Horbin, so then you you are the one who's going to fix yourself, and with the right teachers, the right books, the right videos, the right seminars, the right whatever it's got to whatever you got to go through. But treat yourself as the Horbin. Do your own tear down. Constantly doing your own tear down. Obviously, you got to be strong enough to get your tear down. Some of you should be taking yourself taking it easy a little bit on yourself, um, but. The, uh, but you you got to do your own tear down if you want to build into something that can be um, bring you redemption. But think about it. Think about it. What if what if everyone you know? What if you had big enough influence that everyone you know, first of all, that you did your tear down, rebuilt yourself, and then your closest people did their tear downs and rebuilt themselves to be really whole inside and out. And then they had friends, just three levels. You, your close friends, and their close friends. If you all did that, and then they, including their close friends, and they kept going, I think that's the best thing you can do. I think that's the best, the best you can do to bring the redemption. Um, so someone said, uh, Brocha said, I feel life distracts us, and we don't have time to feel pain of gullus. I would like to connect myself. To myself, I feel if every person thinks into their own life how it would be different if Mashiach would be here, we would truly cry. But I have a hard time connecting. So can you guide us on how to dig deep? Okay, so maybe I'll do a little meditation with everybody. 
to dig deep like that um, before we finish. And uh, and then the, the the other clarification was if if we will be more united, our world will be functioning better. It seems that there's great division and lack of agreement. Oh, that's funny. Someone asked for a meditation after that. If the world is in the darkness that it is, how can we develop the belief in immediate redemption? And then uh, Javi said, in Tanya, we learned that there is no Hashem stuff and not Hashem stuff. Spiritual and materialistic, what you engage in Hashem is in the center of you, so you can enjoy abundance with Hashem in its center. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so I want to mention something that I, is apropos. I've been bringing it up a little bit since last Pesach, but uh, I'll bring it up with you all. And that is, um, and that is that um, it's it's we're we're an we're a very messianic tradition. People forget that all the time, especially when you have uh, when you have like Christians who are clearly a messianic tradition. Um, but we're kind of different in being messianic. Maybe I can distinguish the two. Um, Christians are very uh, afterlife oriented, so they're like, uh, you know, they they they're basically their their campaign is that you know, when you die, you know, by accepting JC, you're uh, redeemed. Um, now, of course, you know that's that's just not no one no one discusses the afterlife in Judaism because because. Uh, Mainly because that we have no idea what yours is, and you know, we don't know what your tests are. And it's totally this, you sleep in the bed you make in this world doesn't matter so much other than believing in God. You know, I guess if you don't believe in God, if you don't believe in spirituality at all, you're not going to get much out afterwards. So, but um, but definitely no free lunch. You know, you're, you're going to sleep in the bed you make in this world. In the and in, sorry, in the next, the bed you make in this world is the bed you'll sleep in in the next. And so we're, we're certainly not into uh, any easy redemption. But because they're, oh, sorry, because we are a messianic tradition, so, so and we are the kind of the fathers of Western religions, um, even though we're hardly Western, we're, we have a lot more in common with Eastern tradition than Western. But because we're the father of the Western, and basically according to the, to the Abraham's, six children that he had with his after sarah died with his new wife katura incense um those six children were sent eastward and are are the founders of the eastern traditions but uh but back to us uh, this messianic thing is the messianic thing was taken very literally by the uh by the christians and and uh and we certainly do believe in a messianic tradition um, of course, it will have to be uh, Davidic. Uh, it'll have to come from the path of David, King David, Mashiach Ben David, which means, unfortunately, you know, no virgin births because the house that you're from, the, the family tradition is from, from via the father. So you have to have a father involved in such a thing. Um, and it will come through the tribe of David, which is from the tribe of Judah, which is good news because... The Judah and the Kohanim, the tribe of Judah, which is what is we have today, is, is the Jews or the Jewish tribe. The other ten lost tribes are are not around anymore. And Binyamin, the tribe of Benjamin, kind of mixed in with Judah. So basically, we're stuck with Judah today, and the Kohanim, the Levites, um, the ten tribes. Please God will be found and uh, and returned. Um, but here's what I wanted to share with you is that, is that when you have a, a strongly messianic tradition like Judaism, you can easily make an, an error. There's a misconception that your focus is meant to be on the actual coming of Mashiach. 
And you see that like Chabad made also that big emphasis, but everyone does. How can you not? I myself did all the years, really. It was only this Passover when I finally realized I'm like, off. Our tradition is a tradition of redemption, meaning, meaning, meaning the whole thing is a redemption. We're just in one big redemption. So when you say, Ana Hashem Hoshiana, please God, save us every Rosh Chodesh. You're in the redemption mode. That is the redemption. It's just maybe it's another tablet that you're popping of redemption. Passover is like a redemption holiday. It's the holiday of our being relieved from Egypt. Wow. And, and that Passover holiday where we are spending an entire seven days in our redemption, that is redemption. Like we are that's what it means by we're in messianic tradition. We are in this constant state of redemption. And when I say this, let me give you this as a, maybe to explain it deeper, is just like a seed rots and sprouts into a tree. You know, it sprouts and then it becomes a tree. It's in a redemption. It's a redemption. And then the fruits fall and rot. And those seeds rot and, and they get washed away into the earth and somehow rot in the earth and then sprout into a redemption. That's that's the world God made. The cells in your body are dying and and new cells are, are sprouting into existence. The whole world is just one big redemption. Will there be a final redemption with a third temple? Yes, that's also going to happen. But it's so easy to be in this redemptive tradition that we're in and and feel like oh man this is like frustrating i'm like i'm sick and tired of waiting and i've been there i know what you're talking about for sure but but it's it's just a misconception redemption is is just the renewal of every moment as creation furthers itself and it's happening in hidden ways you know cellularly it's certainly hidden um, what's happening biologically is certainly hidden. So it's like, it's very hidden how this is going on. You know, this is a, a hidden process. This isn't a, a revealed process. Sorry, I'm moving around so much, but it's hard for me to ever sit still. Um, this is not, this is, a, this is a hidden thing. It's a hidden thing. That's why when you meet a Kabbalist, he's never, he's never, First of all, he's never upset about how long the exile is going on till the third temple. He's not upset. We're in the redemption. It's happening. And, and also, when you tell him about something heavy going on with you, how many times over my lifetime was I going through a heavy crisis, bringing it to the great teacher, you know, the great elder. And the elder looked at me like with, uh, with a sparkle in his eyes. And I'm like, why are your eyes sparkling? Didn't I just tell you something that should have dimmed the sparkle in your eye why is your eye sparkling and because he's he, he's a real jew he's a real jew he's a he's someone who knows we're in redemption we're in a constant state of redemption and and that it's a, it's a lack of responsibility if you think about it. I mean, I know that most of the people who would hang out with me or come to my Zoom class or my YouTube channel are not the lazy types. There are a lot of lazy types out there who are like, yeah, you know, the redemption's not up to us. And, you know, first of all, the first, the first misconception, redemption's only at the end. And second, second mistake is that, hey, you know, it's out of my hands. You know, this is like a lot bigger than me. No, this is totally up to us. We're the we're we're the we're God's big players. You know, we're God's players in this redemption. You know, we are big time the players. You know, we we've got to make this happen. This is up to us now. We are bringing this. I I would break out my guitar if it wasn't Tisha Bob, but I I have a song that goes like this. What do you do? Oh, can you hear the kids outside of that? Do you hear there's kids outside? You know what? Let's let the kids be the kids of Jerusalem. There's some kids out there. So maybe I'll bring the computer a little closer to me.
Okay. So it goes like this. Uh, what do you do? What are you going to do to bring it to speed? Sorry, I haven't sung the song in like, I have no idea how long, a year or two, three years maybe. So it goes like this. Let's try that again. What do you do? What are you going to do to speed the day it comes? What do you do? What are you going to do? Speed the day it comes. Did you help her when she needed you? Hello. Hello. Did you go beyond the love? Hello. Hello. Did you stop and take a rest? Hello. I'm calling you to praise the one above. Oh, yeah, yeah. Whoa. What do you do? What are you going to do? Speed the day it comes. What do you do? What are you going to do? Speed the day it comes. Did you wake up with the greeting? Hello. Hello. Did you? <laughs> anyway, uh, I think I'll do the, the, I'll do the, the bridge. I have tried to do the best I can, but the doubt can shake the strongest hand. I need help to reach our goal. Through our deeds, he'll show. What do you do? What are you going to do? Speed the day it comes. What do you do? What are you going to do? Speed the day it comes. We are standing at the footsteps. Hello, hello. It is happening today. Hello, hello. Do you hear me when I say, hello, I'm calling you to shine and lead the way. Oh, yeah, yeah. Whoa. Um, ba -ba -dum -ba. What do you do? What are you going to do to speed the day it comes? You can sing with me if you want. I can't hear you. What do you do? What are you going to do to speed the day it comes? To speed the day it comes. Want to speak the day yeah, it comes. Want to speak the day yeah, it comes. Want to speak the day yeah, it comes. Boom, boom, boom. Ba, 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 ba. I think that song's on my album, though I'm not sure. Uh, anyway, bottom line in all of that is that it doesn't really matter who the messianic character will be. It's not worth fighting over, not worth bringing up even. The point is, is that redemption is something that's always happening. It's always happening. And you know, that'll give you much more Com com that should give you much more comfort than the comfort of some afterlife promise. I mean, that's just such a garbage. You know, you gotta just live your life in hell until you're until you get your afterlife promise. I mean, that's stupid. That's you know what? That's 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 a promise of hell for two reasons. One is that you know 
you're not going to get the comfort of the redemption that's always with us, always coming in exactly in each day. That's that's the whole analogy of how the sun rises each day and sends its light, you know, from total darkness to total light. Every day, every day, God created a redemptive world. It's in redemption. We're always in redemption. Yeah, could it be better? Sure. I'd like to see the world live in purity, I guess. I would love, love. I want to be, you know, I want to be on stage. I want to be singing in the choir. I know I'm not a lady, but oh my gosh, do I want to be singing in the choir, you know, tambourine in hand, you know. I want to be totally on that, in that role. Oh, would I love that, you know. I feel, you know, I feel like, you know, Somehow I'm supposed to be part of this redemption. I really do. Um, meaning uh, one of the people bringing it in a, in a much bigger way, but but I'm way too much of a wingnut to be the Mashiach. You know? And I'm just too ADHD, you know. Like, unless, you know, like maybe with modern technology and, you know, Elon Musk's chip, I, I seriously would go for being Mashiach myself if. Um, if, you know, one of these chips that they're installing in people, if they could somehow install in me all the Torah. Because <laughs> the, the, whoever is going to be this messianic character has to be like, you know, the most learned of, of all. You know, they really have to be the most learned of all. And I'm like, I'm like the least learned of all. You know? <laughs> <laughs> Such a fusha. You know, the eight years I sat and learned before I became Rabbi Yomto, those eight years where I was just kind of this hidden person and just studying and making Shabbos for my wife and kids and another hundred stragglers that needed a place to eat. I also had them over, but but I felt like I was being irresponsible all eight years for not like helping people. But now looking back, I'm starting to wonder if I should have just stayed in the learning. Maybe came out now. Because that would be been 30 years straight of Torah study. Maybe I came out too, too early. I don't know. But, but maybe I could get one of these brain chips and uh, just have the whole Torah in, in it. I don't, know. I don't know. But I notice I don't get tired. I'm very tired right now, I mean, physically. But I, you know, and, and you notice that I never get tired. No, I, I can just keep going and going and going. I never stop. So I thought that's kind of a good attribute to have if you want to be part of a messianic tradition. Because if I thought I was teaching a lot now, I have a feeling I'd be teaching a lot more. I thought we're busy with that. But, uh, please, Hashem, bring, bring the share. So I'll lead a little meditation. Uh, I'm just going to open up the door behind me, just get some air, because it's uh, just falling apart at this point. Our fast is uh, moving slow. I don't know why they call it a fast. Hold on. Jeez. Whoa. I got like no motor skills left. Oh my gosh. It's actually supposed to drive and pick my wife up. It's kind of a weird backlight. You guys will survive, right? You'll all survive that. My lighting people will be like, what were you thinking? And you know what? I'll probably get the same effect with the door closed a little bit too. We got more kids outside now. Kids on the other side of my studio. Uh, here we go. So we do a little meditation. I'll put on something deep and dark. 
reminding everybody that rockets are being shot all the time, so feel free to say psalms. It's a constant barrage of rockets. Uh, just in the last three minutes, we have several rockets were sent. Um, let's hit the uh, meditation sounds. Go and do not disturb and meditation music. Can you hear it a bit? So I'm going to create a balance. I'll use Hezki as my nod. Hezki, give me a nod. Just show me you're nodding. Okay. Um, I'm going to balance. I need a balance of my voice and the meditation music. Right now, it should be the meditation's a little too loud. Is that right? Nod if it's too loud. Yeah, it's a little too loud. Okay. How's that? Is that better? Is that a good mix? A little softer with the meditation music? Or is that good? Good mix? Okay, everybody, close your eyes. And we'll do a little breath work. Those who can handle a 412-8, we'll do a 412-8 together. Uh, inhales will be through the nose, the 12 will be holding our breath, and the 8 will be the exhales through the mouth. So, with eyes closed, sitting preferably in a good posture. And you can let your eyes float up a little, like between your eye, like as if you were looking between your eyebrows. Let's blow out all our air through the mouth. And breathing into the stomach, stomach expanding through the nose. One, two, three, four. And hold your breath now for 12. Eyes up. Eight, nine, 10, 11, 12. Exhale, eight. Slowly through the mouth as the stomach contracts. Five, six, seven, Eight, inhale through the nose, one, two, three, four, and holding your breath for 12, six, eyes up, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, exhale, eight, one, two, stomach contracting as you blow out the air, eight, inhale, four, one, two, three, four, holding your breath for 12, one, Four eyes up, seven, nine, 10, 11, 12. Exhale, eight. As you release air, release tension in the body. Five, six, seven, eight. Inhale, four, one, two, through the nose, stomach expand. Four, holding the breath for 12. Eyes up, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 20. Exhale, eight, four, five, six, seven, eight. Inhale, four, one, three, four. Holding the breath for 12. Last time, six, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12. And blowing out now all of your air until you have no more air in your body at all. Blowing out all your air until you're totally empty of air. And when you're empty of air, hold your breath as long as you can. When you have to breathe, you'll breathe. Now just breathing, eyes closed, fully relaxed. And go into your heart of hearts now, that inner place of being. You know, that inner awareness place of your awareness of hearing my voice. And, you know, you feel the air on your skin. You're aware of being where you are right now. 
And then you have your thoughts, like you could now think about a bird flying overhead, over the sea you're in. But you're not a bird, you're you thinking about a bird. And you can envision an elderly person praying at the Western Wall. But you're not that person, you're just thinking about that. So clearly you are not your thoughts, you are you. So go to your heart of hearts, to the real you sitting firmly in the seat of consciousness, in that pure state of being that you are. Be in that pure state of being. And in that pure state of being, realize that on the one hand you are you know, really super special, super powerful with like this, like nuclear energy of power inside of you. You know, you are really, really something that's powerful. I mean, you are, even if you're fasting right now, you are in that pure state of being in your heart of hearts of consciousness inside of you. You are full of energy unstoppable energy, pure, powerful, laser beam. It's like a stick of dynamite, you're just power. But at the same time, you are in a crazy situation. You're in the middle of a deep, deep exile. Whether it's the exiled Jewish people, who don't bring the light of Hashem into the world the way they were meant to, or whatever personal things that aren't right in your life because of the disaster of, uh, of our current state. You know, things just aren't right. Look at, look at our, our, you know, what our kids are going through. You know, look at the, the damage control we have to do when they come home from school coldness of the systems that surround us, the culture war that the world's in right now, the most dangerous times we've ever been in, the most uncertain times since World War II. We are, we are in a crazy, crazy time right now. And so you've got this dichotomy going on where part of you is just the most internally whole being because of that consciousness where there is no wrong there is only now pure experience pure consciousness that you have and that never goes away while at the same time surrounding you is, is like the gnashing of the teeth of, of wild dogs exile hell hell in this world And you somehow have that balance of, of pure consciousness with, with that hell. In a constantly renewing world, a constantly renewing redemptive process happening at all times, we are in the middle of a redemption. The world is a redemption. And again, this is why the sagely Kabbalists whose eyes are like the stars luminescent who when hearing even the deepest tribulation can look at you with a calm confidence that this is this too is from Hashem this too shall pass into the next redemption on a personal level in your own life as you will be redeemed from this also and you could be coming to them with an illness and while knowing while well, they will be knowing that your cells will renew themselves. And if they know, if they won't, well, your body will go back to the earth as your soul recycles to the world of souls. This is all very deeply redemptive. Where you can somehow straddle the dichotomy of, of pure consciousness that is whole and redemption, redeem, redeemed whole and redeemed, while at the same time to be in the context of great, 
great destruction all around us. Where the name of God is desecrated, stinks, trampled on day to day. Where his house, the, this conduit between the earth and heaven, Jerusalem is, is a, is a, uh, you know, just a, a, a disgrace, a desecration, you know, a place where, where, you know, trees are planted, which is prohibited by the Torah to plant a tree on the Temple Mount, where, where the vessels are gone, uh, basically hidden by the Vatican from the time of Titus, Titus's conquering of Jerusalem and the precious jewels of the precious of golden vessels carried out and stockpiled in the catacombs of Rome. 80,000 Muslims every Friday putting their behinds up to the Holy of Holies as they face Mecca, creating narratives that have the whole world calling the Jewish people and the Jewish nation an apartheid state. I mean, we are, we are in like, we are in a joke of an exile. Oh my gosh, crazy. And of course, everyone waving their flags and the, the Zionistic Jews waving their state of Israel flags while really inside a one giant mousetrap surrounded on all sides by enemies who are not as I remind everybody there's no such thing as enemies in the, like, in the lexicon of, of the Torah Jews have no enemies they have what are called Soine Yisrael the haters of Israel we don't hate anybody because we know that the path to prophecy meaning the path up the spiritual ladder of Jacob is blocked by hatred you cannot climb that ladder. You can get to a certain level, quite a high level, much higher than any of us are on, but eventually you get blocked by it if you have hatred in your heart. There is no hatred in the heart of a Jew who is a serious practitioner of Judaism. We know that our villainizers, our perpetrators, our, our murderers throughout all the generations you know, whether it be at the hands of Muslims, whether it be the majority of us were in the last 2000 years by the Christians and, and uh, whether it be the Holocaust of the Germans or the, or the gulags of the, of the Russians or the, the terrible, terrible Holocaust of the destruction by the Babylonians and later the Romans in the Second Temple. Holocaust much worse than that of the Germans. The, um, with all that we went through, we never see them as the enemy. We have no enemy. That is the hand of God and they are the messengers. As it says in the book of Jeremiah, the author of the Lamentations we read last night, Nebuchadnezzar, my servant, he was called. The destroyer of the second temple was called Nebuchadnezzar, my servant. When I first read that, I wanted to puke. How could God call, call that monster his servant? But the answer is, is because our proper, the proper way of looking at the world, the proper worldview as a Jew is to know that nothing happens to us that's not the hand of God and part of some greater redemption, some greater fixing. Our destruction is our healing. Our disintegration is our reintegration in a more whole state in this process of redemption that we are on. And so have hope, all of us, have faith, all of us, in this redemption that we're in. We are in the redemption. Know it is so, know it is true. And whisper with your own lips, know it is so. Know it is so, move your lips and say those words. Know it is so, know it is so. You must know that it is so. Know deep in your heart it is so. Know it is so. Whisper, know it is so.
is so. Know it is so. Know that it is so. Know that it is so. Know it is so. And as you hear the numbers between one through five, and five, you'll open up your eyes. Coming up one, two, three, four, and you're opening up your eyes. Five. I hope this was powerful for everybody. Um, much more of this exists, obviously, online. Uh, whether it's Tor Anytime or YouTube or anywhere else my classes show up. Facebook, it's under the name I, I'm, uh, I am a sea of love. I am a sea of love, no spaces. Uh, of course, I bought that domain. Uh, I am a sea of love. Um, please check those out and let's get more and more in tune with the energy that I just shared. Um, that's the energy I go with all day, every day, every minute of my life. Go with that energy. And um, may we see redemption soon in our days. I'll be in New York. And who wants to be with me? I'll be leading seminars and months in uh, Lakewood and Brooklyn after the holidays. Um, I'll be in uh, Muncie and, and in Brooklyn again. And uh, meanwhile, um, everyone's invited to my son's wedding in two days, Tuesday in B'nai B'rach. So uh, blessings, everybody. Love to everyone. May we see redemption soon in our days.